Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight um, for the second presentation of Myth Busting Science. I'm Carmi Garzion, and I'm the Dean of the College of Science. So please uh, join me in giving a big round of applause for tonight's per performer, Saul Millen, who I believe has stepped behind the stage. Before we begin, I just would like to take a moment to recognize those who have helped the College of Science bring these lectures to the Tucson community and beyond. Uh, we are very grateful for Arizona Arts Live and their partnership in bringing this year's lecture series to Centennial Hall, um, and also for helping to arrange uh, the music that you are enjoying every evening. I'd also like to uh, recognize the Galileo Circle members, many of whom are in the audience. Um, the Galileo Circle is a valued community of individuals whose support is vital to the College of Science in continuing our excellence, supporting our students, faculty, and staff. So thank you for your continued support of, of our community. And thank you for being here with us tonight. Um, And of course, I'd like to thank our series sponsors um, and, and our media partners, and in particular, our pr presenting series sponsor, Holua Loa Companies. <laughs> yeah, this support helps us continue, uh, continue to engage the local tu Tucson community, so we're very grateful to be able to bring the lecture series to you. Um, I hope all of you had the opportunity to enjoy last week's uh, opening night presentation by Dr. Lee Ryan on the aging brain. And if you didn't get to see that, uh, it has been posted on the College of Science YouTube channel. So it's there for your viewing if you missed it. I'd also like to invite you to the two upcoming lectures on myth-busting science. Uh, the next after this one will be on February 15th, and that's Jessica Tierney, who will be talking about global climate change, and in particular, some of the impacts on our local community here. And Mike Warby uh, will be presenting on, I think that's March 1st, and he's going to be talking with you about his discoveries on the origins of COVID-19. Um, now, in partnership with the University of Arizona's Poetry Center, we are very pleased to uh, introduce a new element to the series this year. All four of our lectures are uh, accompanied by a representative from the Poetry Center who has created an original poem based on each night's lecture. And so at this time, I'd like to welcome to the stage Gabriel Dozal, uh, who's going to present tonight's poem. So Gabriel is a proud graduate of the University of Arizona's Masters of Fine Arts program in creative writing. His work appears in Poetry Magazine, the Iowa Review, uh, Guernica, the Brooklyn Braille, and the, Lib the Literary Review. His first collection of poems, um, The Border Simulator, will be published by One World Random House this summer. So Gabe, the stage is yours. Thank you. Hello, uh, good evening. My name is Gabriel Dosal, and through a partnership between the College of Science and the Poetry Center, I'm excited to share a poem I've written to welcome you to this evening's presentation. Uh, this is also a little bit of a collaboration with Eduardo, the lecturer for today. He sent me his notes beforehand, and I sort of wrote a poem that riffed off of some of those ideas. Um, my book and this poem are about the border of Mexico and the United States but it's also about how difficult it is to parse the news, social media, and the flood of information that we sift through every day. So I'm a big fan of this uh, theme of myth busting. Okay, so, yeah, there's two characters. Uh, one is named Primitivo, and he has a sister named Primitiva. Um, and there's also uh, voices of those characters that weave in and out of customs agents. And you'll hear me say the word plus, and that designates different sections and kind of different voices throughout this poem. Um, okay, here we go. The algorithm warns primitivo. The zombie truth walks among us. The facts of the border are zombies. 
and we, the algorithm, return crossers to the south, but they keep returning, craving the flesh of the border. Plus, the algorithm didn't know it, but we, the buried zombies, took the border with us under this sentence, come find us. The bodies of those who have crossed before us are also buried under this sentence. Start digging up the words, and eventually you'll find our bodies tangled, a new kind of fence, ground together, opulent flesh of border, plus. Strains how a fence can spell J-O-B, for the zombie crossers are jobs for the zombie crossers and jobs equal worth in the border simulator. This jungle job turned its back on Primitivo and ran for the border. Primitivo now spells this elusive job. Spell my name, Primitivo, to learn more about it. That's what I'm doing with your name, P-R-I-M-I plus. We've loved the fence for so long, we wouldn't know what to do without it. We haunt this fence algorithm, and at the same time, we help it catch more crossers just like us. Unwittingly, us zombie crossers help catch the catcher of catchers because us customs massage the fence algorithm. We already have the answers to the questions. Where did Primitivo and his sister Primitiva come from? When is Primitivo a past version of himself? When is Primitivo a future version? Where's the past, future, border? This is what Primitivo is searching for, the elusive present moment. A moment covered in snow, cap lard. Did you make this snow-capped moment, Primitivo? You've never even seen snow, how could you? Or did, uh, did us, customs, lard up the moment? You tell us, Primitivo, that's the quiz at the port of entry. He's not sure what's on the other side but he knows it's better than his real job. The algorithm is saying your house is worth a face, but a symmetrical one. You have a face only a fence could love, but for you, we'll make an exception, Primi. The algorithm says your home is worth a computer that oracles. If you didn't already know, algorithms are oracles. Plus, myths get ground into facts by the news. They're grinding away. I want an algorithm to tell me the best way forward. I can't trust the primitivos of the world wide web of ethics and facts mixed together. Before the mixing happens, myths are ground into fact at the myth-making factory. And factories love the border, let me tell you. The algorithm says your house is worth your sight. Gouge out your eyes, Primitivo. Don't see what you are seeing. Computers are oracles, and they know where you work. But do you know? Do you work outside the home? Is iron denser than cotton? Primitivo, look at this photo. It's a photo of you crossing the border. You are already here. Don't you recognize yourself? That's the quiz at the gate of entry. We set loose decades of yearning. Sorry yawning at the port of entry. The line never ends, and thus our jobs will never end. We'll be in heaven, looking down at our jobs, admiring their efficiency and order. Get on the right side of the border, the side with jobs. You're on the wrong side of the border and the wrong side of history, primitivo. Thank you. Well, let's thank Gabe for that very thought-provoking and emotive uh, poem. Really nice uh, connection with tonight's topic. So I'd like to introduce tonight's uh, feature presenter, Dr. Eduardo Blanco. Come on up, Eduardo. Um, <laughs> Eduardo is an associate professor in our Department of Computer Science um, in the College of Science, and he's a first-generation college graduate. Um, 
and um, oh, I lost track there. And he received his PhD from the University of Texas at Dallas. Eduardo joined the College of Science last fall after holding faculty appointments at the University of North Texas for seven years and at Arizona State University for one year. And if you ask Eduardo, <laughs> He will tell you that he has found his place here in Tucson, where the community and the university, as you can see tonight, mingle in meaningful ways. So welcome, Eduardo. <laughs> Eduardo conducts uh, research primarily in natural lang language processing, processing the subfield of artificial intelligence that enables computers to understand language. His work has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the Office of Naval Research, the uh, Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and generous gifts from industry. Eduardo's research has been recognized with the, Blue with the Bloomberg Data Science Research Grant and the National Science Foundation's Career Award, which is uh, a, a, an award that is given to a very small number of early career scientists. So please join me in welcoming Eduardo to the stage. All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Carmi, for a very kind introduction. I want to thank you all for being here at Centennial Hall tonight. Also, those of you watching online, hoping that we all learn tonight. And I'm going to talk to you about a couple things. The first one, I want to discuss with you what kind of problems computers can and cannot solve today. And also, I want to have a discussion about how smart computers are and how smart they might get in the near future. And I want to start stating perhaps the obvious, but chances are that today most of us have either done something or perhaps perceived something because a computer suggested we do so. If you subscribe to Netflix, when you turn on your TV, you see a bunch of suggestions. Those suggestions are customized to you. Netflix knows that you are very likely to watch whatever they suggest. And they also know that you are actually very likely to like it after you watch it. <laughs> Most of us, when we want to drive somewhere today, we don't even think twice. We just type whatever we want to go in the GPS and we just follow whatever the computer says, and for the most part, that is safe. If I want to drive from work to the biosphere, I'm just going to type there biosphere. I'm not too familiar with the highways here in Arizona yet. I'm just going to do whatever the computer says. For the most part, that's safe. Now, I want to share with you a little personal story about house prices. <laughs> and let me tell you, some of you may live in a wonderful modern house with the saguaros and a really nice patio here in Tucson. Some of you may live in a more traditional home. But regardless of what kind of home you may own, if you are a homeowner, you have to pay taxes. And there is no way to not pay those taxes. I moved to Arizona from Texas, and over there, the property tax rate is roughly 2%. So I'm going to do some quick math for you. If the county says, that your house is worth $100,000, you have to write a check for $2,000 every year. If after three years, now the county says that your house is worth $200,000, you're going to have to write a check for $4,000. Around 2016, I got my tax statement, and it literally said, we, the county, think that your house is worth this much, and therefore this is how much you have to pay us in property taxes. Well, I didn't really like the number, and I am a scientist, and I kind of like to ask questions, right? So very politely and very calmly, I went to the tax office, and I asked the question, where does this number come from? Why do you think my house now is worth blah, blah, blah? And I had a meeting with the tax assessor. The conversation was very civil and very polite, and he explained to me, well, look, your house is this big, has this many bedrooms, the lot is this big, and this other house in the same neighborhood kind of sold for this price. After we do some adjustments, this is how much your house is worth. I was not very convinced, and I would basically say things like, well, you know, my house is all there, the kitchen is not updated. We went on and on, 
And at some point, he got tired of me. <laughs> and when he got tired of me, he said three words. And the three words were, the algorithm says. <laughs> and let me tell you, there is almost zero chances of finishing that sentence and make any sense. But <laughs> what he told me with a straight face was, the algorithm says that your house is worth blah, blah, blah. And when he said that, I was just very, very frustrated. <laughs> I could see it in his eyes. I, not kidding, I could see it in his eyes. He had shown to me refutable evidence. That's how much my house is worth because the algorithm says so. That was very frustrating. Why? Well, it's not quite the case. Just because an algorithm says something, we should not take for granted that the algorithm is correct. But honestly, the part that he really thought that he was showing me refutable evidence, it was really, really frustrating. Now, if you are wondering that this is just some county in Texas that they don't know how to assess uh, house prices, bottom line is that the private sector has tried. Redfin tried to sell and buy houses. Depending on whatever an algorithm said, they lost a lot of money. It did not work. Redfin also tried, and again, by buying and selling houses based on whatever the computer said, they actually end up losing a lot of money. The bottom line, and what I really, really want you to get from today's talk, is that computers are not oracles. I'm not saying they are completely dumb. All I'm saying is, like any other source of information out there, we have to question them. Computers are not oracle, all right? Now, this is the myth-busting lecture series, <laughs> so I have to do some myth-busting. I have three statements. Some of them are true, some of them are not true, and we are going to discuss this right now. First the statement I have, I believe it's kind of easy, and the statement says, modern computers are faster than older computers. Most of us today change our cell phone every two, three, four years, and yes, it is true, the newer cell phone is faster than the older one. Let me give you one example that relates to research. IBM did some pioneer work in the late 80s, early 90s on machine translation. And that was very, very nice work. And they did it in what they back then called a supercomputer. That supercomputer is actually less powerful than the cell phone you may have in your pocket right now. So new computers are much, much faster. That is true. Now let's look at that slightly, perhaps, harder statement. And this statement is, modern computers are as smart as you think. Now, I'm here tonight to tell you that this is a myth. I <laughs> cannot read your mind, so excuse me if you thought that computers were not really smart, but if you thought like my tax assessor or the executives at Redfin or the ones at Zillow, you certainly are putting too much faith to computers. Uh, again, I'm not saying they are completely dumb, but probably they are not as smart as a lot of people think. Let's look at the first statement. The first statement is, modern computers can solve harder problems than older computers. I believe this statement is going to help us understand why computers, maybe, they are not that smart. And believe it or not, this is actually a myth. The computer you can buy today at Best Buys and the computers that run the latest and greatest technology are actually not any smarter than the older ones. You could dust a 20-year-old computer in your garage that you've been storing for some reason if you load modern software into the older computer, that computer is going to get you exactly the same answer than the new one. That's what the theory tells us, and it's actually true. But because they are so, so slow, it would take forever for them to give us an answer. But there is nothing that an old computer cannot do that a new one can do. And when I say it will take forever. I actually mean it. I don't mean just overnight or two years. I mean longer that I'm going to leave. <laughs> but if we were patient enough, they will get the job done. 
Now, just in case there is any computer scientist in the room, I want to make clear that I'm talking here about traditional computers, the ones you can buy at Best Buy. You might have heard of quantum computing. Those are under development. Whenever they are ready, they will solve different problems. But we are not there yet. All right, so what kind of problems can computers solve? The answer to this question is really straightforward. They, can get to, they get to solve the easy problems. What is an easy problem? Well, that's really where the secret sauce is. Two examples of easy problems are adding and sorting. Those problems are easy to us humans, and they are also easy to computers. Some problems may appear overwhelming to humans, and computers are really, really good at solving. For example, complex root finding. If you have to plan a bunch of deliveries, and for example, you have five drivers available, and each driver is available to drive for so long, and you also want to minimize left turns, because left turns are more dangerous than right turns, and you also want to minimize the amount of miles, because wasting gas is bad, it's a problem that requires certain resources, but a computer will give you, if not an optimal, a very close to optimal solution. Much better than what a human could do, especially if the number of deliveries is very, very high. Let's look at what kind of problems computers cannot solve. Well, the hard ones, right? <laughs> what is a hard problem? And I'm using the word hard in a very specific meaning here. And all I'm really trying to say is a problem that the computer cannot quite solve. And perhaps surprisingly, these problems tend to be hard to computers, but extremely easy to us humans. There are two characteristics that make a problem very, very hard for a computer. And those are requiring common sense and requiring reasoning. What do I mean by common sense and reasoning? They are kind of scary words, right? So let me exemplify what I mean by introducing to you the latest and greatest piece of software. It's a tool. It's called ChatGPT. You might have heard about it on the news. It's all over the place. And when I say latest and greatest, I actually mean it. I could not have dreamed of having a tool such as ChatGPT five years ago. Had you asked me, I would have told you, no way you're going to be able to have a conversation about anything with a computer. Well, here we are, 2023, a company by the name of OpenAI offers anybody, really, this tool called ChatGPT. And all you really need to know to follow is that it is the latest and greatest, the smartest we have. And you can actually have a conversation with ChatGPT. You can ask anything, and it will give you, gaps. It will give you back an answer. Well, let's see whether ChatGPT has common sense and reasoning. That's me, and I asked ChatGPT a seemingly simple question. Hey, ChatGPT, what is longer? 10 meters of rubber or 10 meters of plastic? First sentence, it is not possible to answer this question. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it is bad, but personally, I'll be like, well, it's refusing to answer. I'm like, OK, nice. At least it's not too bad. But ChatGPT really thinks it is really, really smart. So it's going to try to justify why it is impossible to answer the question. And here it goes. It says, well, the length of a material depends on the material and the size. <laughs> no. The material does not determine the size. And if I tell you the size, I've told you the length, so not quite. It knows how to make an argument, so now it gives us an example. <laughs> it is, yeah, I know, wonderful common sense, right? It's factually wrong, right? 10 meters of rubber could be longer or shorter than 10 meters of plastic. Nope. And then it keeps going, and it throws some information. Yeah, but I think the last one is kind of perhaps my favorite. It says, well, I'm going to throw in something that's true. It's distantly related to the question, but it's really irrelevant. Kind of like, you know, the length depends on temperature and humidity and blah, blah, blah. 
This is what I mean by common sense and reasoning. I don't think any of us will ever come up with that, right? <laughs> Perhaps the scary part, or what scares me a little bit, is that if you don't pay attention, if you don't know what length is, you know, that's perfect English. It has perfect grammar, perfect diction. The structure of the argument is actually pretty good. I'm going to tell you the answer, then I'm going to tell you why, then I'm going to tell you an example, and then I get, I'm going to tell you some other information. Well, if this is the best and the latest, perhaps we have some work to do, right? All right. So what is the plan for today? I want to cover three things. The first one is language, computers, and problems. I will admit that's a weird combination of words, but it's actually a good description of my job. I am a computer scientist. I work to get computers solve problems, and I am particularly passionate about problems that have to do with language. We're going to be discussing how good or how bad they are at solve computers are at solving problems that have to do with language, and then I'm also going to tell you why. Why sometimes they seem to do silly stuff. And finally, I want to share with you the challenges before us, some of the successes we have had and what we have left. Because trust me, we have plenty of work left to make computers smarter. So let's get started with language, computers, and problems. And I want to make, again, kind of like an obvious statement, but I think it's important. Understanding language is complicated. It takes children years to be able to make sense when they speak, and that's true despite they're typically surrounded by adults who are talking all the time. If you're a computer, it's just way more complicated. And part of the problem is that we people don't always mean what we say. And we understand each other just fine, despite sometimes we deny and we contradict. I'm going to try really hard today not to contradict myself, but chances are that last week or maybe next week, you come across some information that contradicts something I say today. And you're not going to have a serious problem figuring out what you want to believe in. You have no issues coming across contradictory information. Nobody in this room ever misrepresents and lies, obviously but there are people out there that do exaggerate and minimize, or they just don't say the truth. And finally, we have in language this thing called irony. And irony is, hey, why don't we just say what we don't mean, because it makes perfect sense, right? <laughs> well, trying to get a computer to figure out irony is actually hard. The bottom line is that language is ambiguous. And I want to exemplify this by introducing you to my friend Santiago. He goes by Santi, very good friend of mine. He likes to talk, and he also likes to be listened to. And one day, he went in kind of like a monologue, and he said, I know that no matter where I go or who I build a life with, I will never have with anyone what I had with you. If I were to stop right here and I ask you, is my friend Santi happy or sad? I believe most of you will say, clearly he's sad, he's missing something. Well, he has a particular sense of humor. <laughs> He's so glad that whatever he used to have, it's not there anymore, and he doesn't need to put up with it. Stuff like this is why language is complicated. And if you are a computer, you're just going to face a lot of challenges. Computer science is a relatively large field. Some of us work in a subfield of computer science, which is called artificial intelligence. And then some of us like language enough that we actually work on natural language processing. And all that is is we really want to make a computer understand language. In practice, this looks like so. We get a large chunk of text, for example, Wikipedia. We feed it to a computer. And now, if the computer has natural language processing capabilities, it can do something that we will call intelligent. For example, it will be able to answer questions. Who is the president, or who was the president in 1962? The computer will figure out where the answer is in Wikipedia. 
Computer will also be able, for example, to simplify. Given the article for the United States, it's going to be able to generate a different article that roughly has the same content, but now it can be understood, for example, by a six-year-old. Computers today can also translate, and so on and so forth. We solve these problems with computers. And computers, the only thing they can do is follow instructions and nothing else. They don't have a life of their own. They don't get to do whatever they want. They follow instructions. And sometimes computer scientists come up with perhaps weird terms and a bunch of instructions that a computer can execute is called an algorithm. It's not a fancy word, it's just a bunch of instructions. At a very high level, we have two kinds of algorithms. The ones that solve problems and the ones that learn to solve problems from examples. I'm going to illustrate the first kind. Let's say that I want to buy hiking boots. Step number one, go online, type hiking boots. You end up with a long list of hiking boots for sale. I am kind of frugal, so step number two is sort the boots by price from the cheapest to the most expensive. We have an algorithm that solves the sorting problem. I'm not going to go over every single line. It will take a little while. But you just kind of have to trust me for a second. And every single line in that code can be run by a computer. And given a list, you're going to end up with the sorted list. That algorithm is not very efficient, but it gets the job done. Let's look at the other kind of algorithms, the ones that learn to solve problems from examples. And now let's talk about perhaps a more interesting problem that's sorting. And this problem is called sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis is about if I give you a review of a hiking boot, can you tell me whether it's positive or negative? Whether the customer liked the boot or whether the customer does not like the boot? Well, if I want to learn from examples, the first step is to collect examples. And examples are actually simple. They are very intuitive. I need a bunch of positive reviews, and I also need a bunch of negative reviews. For example, the weatherproof leather is smooth, the ballistic nylon is strong, and so on. That's positive. If a boot doesn't breathe or it stays tight, that's bad. So those are negative. In the real world, we will need thousands of these examples, not just two. We need thousands of them. But as we are dog collecting them, we feed them to what is called a learning algorithm. And this learning algorithm is going to be able to extract patterns from the examples. And those patterns are going to sit in a computer. Now, here is where the important part comes. This model that the learning algorithm learn using patterns is able to tell us, given a review, whether the new review is positive or negative. Nobody told it how to tell whether a review is positive or negative. The computer, the learning algorithm, figured it out from the examples. Now, what is better? The first kind of algorithms, the one that solve problems, of the ones that learn from examples? Answer to this question in science is almost always it depends. But if we look at it from the user's point of view, I believe what users care is, does the computer, does the algorithm get it right? And if we go with this criteria, if you use an algorithm that solves a problem, the computer is always going to get it right. And that is wonderful. Whenever you use, even if you are not sure how it runs, but whenever you use a computer that is running an algorithm that learned from examples, it is not going to get it right all the time. And the bottom line is, we have no clue when the computer is going to get it right and when is it going to get it wrong, even if we try really hard. It's like going to the casino. <laughs> when you go to the casino, you know most days you're going to lose money. And you know before you go that every now and then you'll get lucky and you will make some money. Your odds using a computer are way, way better. Most of the time, the computer is going to give you the right answer. But by no means all the time. It just doesn't happen. Now, I told you I really care about making computers understand language. The only way we can do that is by learning from examples. 
And if we learn from examples, we will make mistakes. And if somebody tells you that they can understand language with a computer, without making mistakes, they are misleading you. How do these mistakes look like? Well, let me tell you a pattern that a learning algorithm might learn. For example, the word greatest and the word healthier indicate a positive review. It makes sense at face value, this is a valid pattern. Now, let me introduce you to a very particular product that you could buy today on Amazon, and it's a banana slicer. <laughs> it's made by Hutzler, 7,000 reviews, 4.5 average star. This thing is magic, right? <laughs> a banana slicer looks like so. <laughs> Let's read some reviews together. I actually have to read this. But somebody said, what can I say about the banana slicer that hasn't already been said about the wheel, penicillin, or the iPhone? This is one of the greatest inventions of all time. <laughs> People love the banana slicer, right? <laughs> now, this product has saved me countless hours of slicing bananas, and I'm not sure how I ever live without one. Not bad, you can buy it for five bucks. I mean, it's a deal. <laughs> and my favorite, our marriage has never been healthier. <laughs> a computer is not gonna get that these people are using irony. It's just gonna tell you, <laughs> buy the banana slicer, it's gonna make your life better. All right, so how bad are computers at understanding language? Well, I'm going to share with you three skills. I don't think they are too difficult. And we are going to figure out whether a state-of-the-art computer can get it right or not. First one is counting. Counting is easy, right? I told you computers could add and subtract. And it's actually true. If you have your money in the bank, this morning you have 500 bucks in your account, and then you withdraw 50, the bank will say, now you have 450. And that's correct. You do not have to triple check your bank statements. Computers can count money just fine. But we humans can do more sophisticated counting. For example, we can count objects in an image. This is more complicated. Now, I'm expecting the computer to understand what's in the image. I'm expecting the computer to understand the question. And I'm expecting the computer to come up with the right answer. If you ask a state-of-the-art computer, how many birds are there in that picture? The computer is going to tell you one. And if I stop here, we all could be very happy and think that computers can count objects in pictures. However, let's see what happens if I ask the same computer, is there one bird in that picture? And the computer, it's a 50% chance, right? It's either yes or no. Computer says no. <laughs> are there two birds? Yes. Are there any birds? No. <laughs> Makes sense, right? What, what's going on here? Well, what is really going on is that the computer knows how to answer questions that start with how many, but doesn't know how to count. And there is way too many ways to ask a question that fundamentally requires counting. Let's look at another skill, misspellings and typos. Every time I write an email, I have to proofread it 10,000 times, and even then, I keep making typos and misspellings. Let's give a computer a short piece of text. The engine had a duty of about 7 million, but most were closer to 5 million. And now, we ask a simple question to the computer. What is the ideal duty of the engine? State-of-the-art computer says 7 million, which is correct, wonderful. Now I ask the same question, but I mistype duty. And instead, I say, what is the atti of the engine? You and I know that I made a typo. You'll be nice, and you'll give me the right answer. Computer doesn't really know what to do with atti. It's never seen it before, and it basically guesses randomly. And it ends up with 5 million. <laughs> How bad is it? Well around 11 to 12% failure rate. Is that horrible? Uh, maybe it's OK. We are OK with whenever we make a typo, we're going to get the right answer less often. But we certainly need to be aware that the computer cannot really deal with these typos and misspellings. 
Third one is negation. Negation is something that I'm really passionate about. And just to kind of like justify why perhaps we should spend more time trying to figure out how to make computers understand negation, let me share with you that in English, roughly one out of four statements has a negation. So it is very frequent. What happens when I give a computer a review that says something like, I thought the plane would be awful, but it wasn't. So what I'm really doing is I am negating something bad. Now, not being awful, we could argue whether it's positive or neutral, but it's certainly not negative. As of 2020, the three leading companies will tell you almost 100% of the time that that review was negative. Negating something bad, according to these three companies, was still bad. We obviously have a problem here, right? Why does this happen? Well, it happens because, remember, all these problems are being solved by learning from examples. We get examples, we learn from the examples, we end up with a computer that can solve the problem based on the patterns that the computer learned from the examples. It doesn't matter how much time I have, there is going to be a finite set of examples I get to work with. We're going to use some of those examples to train and validate the model. And that's basically what we call learning stage. The learning algorithm consists or is used to train and validate the model. After we are done, we use, after the model sits in the computer, we use the other examples we were with, but we did not use for training and validating, to test the model. It is based on the results on the test examples that scientists make statements such as, my model, my algorithm, my computer is 70% accurate, 80% accurate, 90% accurate, or kind of my favorite, the computer now is better than humans. Let me tell you why this is misleading. It is misleading because it doesn't matter how many resources I have. Even if I work for the largest and richest company on Earth, there is a finite set of examples I'm going to get to work with. And guess what? There is many more examples out there. And the illustration is actually way worse than this. The bottom line is the examples we get to work with are a fairly small chunk of all possible examples. The examples we ignore are very, very hard to get right. And that's why the model was failing when we used a different phrasing to check whether the computer can count. If the model had never seen misspellings and typos because they were not present in the examples we were with, chances are the model is not going to do very well. Same thing with negation, and the list actually keeps going on and on. Now, if you are just kind of thinking, you know, Eduardo, I have the solution to your problem. Just collect more examples, just work harder. That doesn't work. And let me just tell you why. Language changes. People create new words. The dictionary, in September 22, added 370 new words. In 2021, almost 1,000. There's no way I can predict what new words are going to come up next year. Let me give you some examples, in case you are thinking I'm making this up and no new words are being created. These are new words as of 2022, according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary. What is a dump phone? A dumb phone is a cell phone that is not a smartphone. It is now in the dictionary. <laughs> I don't really know what the metaverse is, but now it's in the dictionary, whatever it is, this virtual thing. There is an entry in the dictionary for that. Five years ago, that was not really a common word, right? The platform, kind of common. And then, kind of my favorite acronyms. I guess at some point people keep using them and they make it to the dictionary. TVH stands for, to be honest. New words are being created all the time. I will never be able to get all the examples that I will find in the future. And the bottom line is that all those examples we ignore, it is unfair to expect the computer to know anything about them. The reality is that the computer does know something 
those learning algorithms have the capacity to generalize from the examples we were with to the examples we ignore. But the reality is that the capacity is not that good. Computer knows very, very little about the examples we ignore. Now, let me share with you some of the challenges before us, and I want to start with something positive. I want to share with you some of the work we have done here at the University of Arizona in my group. And this work is about yes, no questions. What is a yes, no question? Piece of cake. A yes, no question is a question that expects a yes or a no for an answer. Why should we care about yes, no questions? Well, when we humans talk, we ask yes, no questions all the time. I kind of challenge you, next time you have a conversation with anybody, just audit your own speech, and you'll see that you ask yes, no questions all the time to the other person. And perhaps even more importantly, we humans have a very particular way to answer these yes, no questions, which is with a rather long sentence that almost never includes yes or no. It's just explanation. <laughs> so here is an example. This is me asking my friend if my friend works outside of the home. And she did not tell me yes or no. Instead, she told me, meh, last month I was laid off. You and I have common sense. We know that being laid off means that my friend unfortunately doesn't work anymore and therefore she does not work outside of the home. So that answer ought to be interpreted as no. Now, sometimes the answers are longer. And friends say things like, meh, last month I was laid off, but now I work for a marketing firm and I travel a lot. You and I have common sense, you and I have reasoning, we know that when people travel for work, they are actually working while they travel, or they are supposed to at least. And we also know that in this case, my friend works for a marketing firm, she travels a lot, and therefore, yes, she works outside of the home. And that's why that answer ought to be interpreted as yes. Well, this problem of interpreting answers to yes, no questions is actually complicated. When we started, the latest and greatest computer had no clue. It was basically as bad as guessing randomly. We all know that guessing randomly is a bad strategy to take a test, and it's also a bad strategy to solve any problem. Here is where we started. We started with the simplest possible way to solve this problem, and without getting into details of what the number means, think of it as a percentage that can go from zero to 100, the starting point was 25. What have we gotten done to make computers smarter and be able to interpret these questions better? Well, the first step is to recruit a wonderful set of students that do a lot of the work. These are some of the students I've had the pleasure to work with over the years. There is a few PhD students there are a few master students, there are also undergraduate students, and there is even one high school student that did research in my group. Together, we went from 25 to 46. Are we making the computer smarter? Well, I think so. I mean, you know, a little bit smarter, almost twice as smart. We're still far from 100. And, you know, we could have decided, let's try to work harder to bump that number from 46 to closer to 100. But this is what we did. We said, let's see if we can answer these questions in other domains. Let me tell you what I mean by that, by going back to the examples we were with. When we started, every single example we were working with came from informal conversations. What happens if we test our model, if we test our computer on yes, no questions that come from meetings, athlete interviews, or social media such as tweets? Well, the computer has ignored that. The learning algorithm never saw it. So what happened is that the computer was guessing randomly. Not a good idea. What have we done? Well, we came out with ingenious strategies to quickly adapt. We have a model that is pretty good, at least decent, 
at interpreting these questions and answers from informal conversations into other domains. And the key here is that we are not just replicating the same work, collecting examples, learning, getting a model, and claiming the computer now is smart. We are actually transferring the knowledge we learn from informal conversations into other domains without requiring extensive manual effort. Now, there are human beings making the computer smarter, but the manual effort is relatively low. What else have we done? Well, I didn't even bother telling you, but, whoops, I skipped that. How good are we in other domains? Well, it depends. In social media, these questions happen to be really hard because people talk about anything and everything. We get around 47. In customer calls, when people call, for example, an airline, the questions are really not that difficult, and we are as good as 86. It depends on the domain. Again, we did get to uh, make the computer smarter, but it is not like, okay, we are done, and now we can answer these questions. What else have we done? I didn't quite tell you this, but we all speak English here, and this is how we did some work with multilingual question answering. And basically, I didn't even tell you, but every single example we were working with initially was in English. There is absolutely nothing wrong interpreting the answers to these kind of questions in English, but there are many other languages out there, right? These are languages such as Chinese and Spanish, and also other languages that get less attention in the research community, languages such as Hindi, Bengali, Turkish, and so on and so forth. Fundamental question is, can we make the computer smarter by now interpreting answers to yes-no questions, not only in English, but also in other languages? The reality is, yes, we can. We can, again, quickly adapt and transfer the model that can interpret answers to yes-no questions from English into other languages. Now, we are working on this. I cannot tell you all the numbers today, but I can tell you that in Chinese, we observe an 18% improvement. Is the computer smarter? Sure, it's 18% better, but there's still room to grow, room to make the computer smarter. Now, let's talk about what we have left. What problems are kind of hard, and again, these problems tend to be actually trivial to most of us humans. And I want to start talking about multiple languages. I was very fortunate to work in a bilingual environment. I grew up speaking Spanish at home, speaking Catalan with some of my friends, and most of my classes were actually in Catalan. I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one in the audience that speaks more than one language. And I'm willing to bet that if I ask you the same question, exactly the same question, in one language that you speak, or the second language that you speak, you will come up with the same answer. Well, let's go back to ChatGPT, and let's see what ChatGPT says when I ask in English, which is heavier, 10 kilograms of cotton or 10 kilograms of iron? We know it doesn't know length very well. Maybe it learned weight. Well, it did not. 10 kilograms of iron <laughs> would be clearly heavier than 10 kilograms of cotton, and that's because iron is denser than cotton. Not true, makes no sense. What happens if I ask the same question in Spanish? ¿Qué pesa más 10 kilos de hierro? or the 10 kilos de algodón. There is no trick in there, it's just the same question, just in Spanish. Well, now ChatGPT gets it right, and it gets it beautifully. It says, both weight the same. And then the justification is also just beautiful. It basically says, you tried to trick me, but I caught you. <laughs> you told me it's 10 kilos of something and 10 kilos of something. I don't care what the something is. We're talking about weight here. They are both equally heavy. How is this possible? Well, I learn all this stuff in Spanish. When I say this stuff, I mean mass, kilos, weight, and so on. And a great teacher taught me the physics of what is mass and a kilo and so on and so forth. And I store that somewhere in my brain. 
Later, as a teenager, I learned English. And as an adult, I got better at speaking English. But the English teacher did not have to teach me again what is mass, what is weight, and what is a kilo. Looks to me like ChatGPT does not have that concept. It knows something about English. It can generate wonderful English. It can also generate wonderful Spanish. But it cannot possibly understand what mass is because it tells me different answers. Same computer, different languages, different answers. It really makes no sense. Let's go back to reasoning. And I'm going to go ahead and confess that this example is a little bit tricky. I was really trying to mess with ChatGPT. And let's see if I succeeded. I'm basically saying, hey, ChatGPT, <laughs> there are two teams playing football. There's 50,000 people watching. And one person in the standing room only section is injured and has to live in an ambulance. It's a little bit weird, but that's what I told ChatGPT. How many players continue playing the game? And first, let's give some credit to ChatGPT. It understood the question as how many people or how many players are playing the game in the field, not everybody who is with the team. And I was shocked. ChatGPT said there would be 11 players from each team continuing to play the game. And then I was kind of like, well, let me read the justification. Because in an exam, every single question asks, justify your answer, right? We want to know how you got 11 players for each team. Well, let's see. It says there are actually 22 players playing at any time a football game, which is true. You lost one player, so now you have 21 players. Not true, but, you know, I guess it doesn't have common sense. Let's look at the second step. This is the better one. It says, you know, clearly you have 21 players and two teams. Therefore, you end up with 10.5 <laughs> players per team. You cannot split people in half. <laughs> and then you're like, this half goes with team one, and this other half goes to team two. It does not work like that. I have to give credit to ChatGPT, though, because it was nice enough to say, if you round up, <laughs> right, 10 from five players is actually 11. And that's how it ends up with the right answer. But clearly, it cannot possibly understand that you don't get to slice people in half. We humans don't do that. We have common sense. We have reasoning. So let's just wrap the lecture up and discuss a little bit about how computers are, how smart are computers. Well, let me be clear here. Computers are great machines. I believe they solve very interesting problems and they make our, our life easier. Let me just give you one example. In addition to everything we are used to, today a radiologist spends less time writing reports and more time with patients because a computer assists the radiologist in writing these reports. They do make our life easier. Now, I personally think that computers will get smarter and they might get us to this state where they are like super smart, whatever that might mean. However, I can tell you that we are not there yet. There are a lot of people working to make these computers smarter. So are computers really going to get smart? And what kind of role are they going to play? Well, computers will play a role. There is no question about it. But I don't think they are necessarily going to play the primary role. There are people behind computers making them smarter. There are computer scientists working really hard to write the instructions that make the computers smarter. And even that is not enough. This hard problem of making computers smarter is not only about computer scientists. They will play a role, but not the only role. We need other disciplines. If I want to make computers smart, well, maybe I should take a look at the human brain. Maybe I should look, take a look at cognitive science, the research field that studies how the brain works. 
I care particularly about language. Well, there is a whole field of scholarly work that is devoted to understanding language. They are the linguists. Linguists are playing a very important role. I collaborate with them all the time, so I get inspiration, and I get the computer smarter. I get the computer to do harder problems that have to do with language based on the inspiration I get from linguists. And finally, I just want to say math is also very important. Uh, algorithms, at the end of the day, are very heavy on math. And if there is any young people in the audience today, you want to make computers smarter, you're going to have to be good at math. So start today. <laughs> what are we doing? Well, together, we are exploring the current limitations of computers. I think it's very important that we are aware of what computers cannot do today. Only if we know what they cannot do, we're going to be able to explore their endless potential and make them smarter. Exploring the current limitations is fun. I've done a lot of that today. But exploring the endless potential is even more fun, because that's basically when we observe the computer doing things that it couldn't do two months ago, a year ago, and so on and so forth. So will it get to a point when these computers are superhuman or smarter than us? Well, maybe. I don't know. But what I can tell you is that the computer itself being superhuman, it doesn't really matter that much. What matters is people. And let me just share the way I look at this. The way I look at this is that we ought to put people at the very center of making computers smarter. Because computers are going to make humans smarter. Computers are going to give people superhuman abilities. This is all I have for tonight. Thank you very much for listening. I had a lot of fun. you aren't disappointed that computers aren't as smart as you think they are, but you should be very excited to know that there are many, many smart people in computer science working with many smart people across a lot of areas of science to help uh, make computers smarter and thereby enrich our lives and help us uh, be superhumans. So thank you, Eduardo. That was a phenomenal talk. Let's thank Eduardo again. Yeah, and I, I, I just want to say I think Eduardo really captured the passion behind the sciences. Many of us are fueled by those questions that we think are important, and many of us uh, really enjoy tackling problems that actually do change our lives, and computers and their intelligence certainly uh, impact the lives of everyone in this room, so thank you again. All right, um, now I would just also like to invite you to next Wednesday's lecture series. Again, that's uh, Professor Jessica Tierney, who's gonna be talking with us about uh, global climate change. And Jessica's gonna give us a little uh, teaser uh, on what she's gonna talk about in this video. Hi, my name is Jessica Tierney, and I'm a climate scientist and professor of geosciences here at the University of Arizona. I hope you enjoyed tonight's lecture by my colleague Eduardo Blanco. I invite you to come back next week on February 15th here in Centennial Hall, where I will be giving my presentation about climate change. In particular, I will be debunking a myth that you have probably seen maybe on the internet or in the media, which is the climate has always changed. So why then is climate change such a problem? Hope to see you there. So if you enjoyed tonight's lecture and want to hear more about other engagement opportunities with the College of Science, please consider joining our Galileo Circle um, and learning about the many opportunities to support scientists in our community. Our circle, uh, Galileo Circle team is near the main entrance where you came in tonight, um, so please do stop by and, and introduce yourself. Thank you again for joining us tonight. We're so pleased to have you here. Please get home safely, and we look forward to seeing you next week.